Hey folks, welcome to another edition of the Processing Blue podcast, where this week the Panthers will actually be wearing Processing Blue jerseys, I believe, along Woo. with red and black helmets. But anyway, I'm Mike K, <laughs> Charlotte Observer beat reporter uh, covering the Panthers. Did you forget your title? Did you forget your title for a second? Yes. I, I mean, you only say it. I mean, we say it literally every day, but go on. Anyway, thanks for interrupting, Alex. <laughs> oh, by the way, this is Alex Zutlow. He is also a Panthers beat reporter for the Charlotte Observer. And we are here to process some blue. Uh, and yes, also process a ton of injuries. I mean, Alex, I'd, I'd ask you how you were doing, but I don't want another injury report to add, added to this discussion. But let's get into it because the Panthers lost Austin Corbett um, to a season-ending biceps injury. Um, that's rough, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Panthers really went all in on betting on him converting to center after two procedures that he had on his knee. Um, and now he's dealing with something with his arm. It's just, it's unfortunate because he's about to become a free agent. He's also a leader on this team and it had been one of the best playing players, playing players, (laughs) uh, on the squad so far this season. He was one of the bright spots. Um, and we'll get into Austin in a second, but I also feel like we should run down the rest of the injuries here. Taylor Moten, who has started 104 consecutive games and played 120 consecutive games. Uh, basically, he's played in every game of his career, the uh, anti-JC horn. Um, but he is finally going to see those streaks end this week. He's got a triceps injury. We don't really know when he's going to return. According to Dave Canales, there's a big timeline there. Um, And then the day-to-day guys are a pair of shoulder injuries. Wide receiver Xavier Leggett, Jadavian Clowney. I guess if you went to South Carolina and play for the Panthers, there's a large chance of having a shoulder injury in week six. And then, you know, starting tight end Tommy Tremble is in the concussion protocol, which could vary because everybody's concussions are different. Let's talk about Corbett, though, because... I feel like this team invested so much in this offensive line between paying two guards exponential money and they've both delivered when they've played Mm -hmm. and then moving Corbett into center. Like how big of a loss is this, Alex? Oh, it's massive. It's huge. I mean, the play that's ringing in my head right now, as you're talking about all these injuries, particularly on the offensive line is the one is the pretty much the one explosive play the Panthers had all game last week, which was when, Chuba runs right behind Damian Lewis uh, on the left side. It was just a simple um, uh, run right behind him. And Damian opens up a huge hole, which is no, which he's known to do by turning the uh, defensive lineman inside. Austin Corbett pulls and gets to the second level of the defense, which is one of his strengths as being a really athletic center. And then Robert Hunt kind of on the other side gets to the second level and blocks like a a key linebacker. And that springs Chuba Hubbard to go untouched for a 30 plus yards and a touchdown, giving the Panthers a seven zero lead. Like that is what the Panthers pay for. Those three guys this off season were the crux of their improvements on the offensive side of the ball. They were the ones who were supposed to give Bryce Young time to step, to climb into the pocket and to plant that foot down and throw the ball cleanly. Um, And So losing Austin is huge in that because he was a third of that. He was a third of that plan. He was the interior offensive line is what they were investing in. Um, Taylor Moten being gone is also big because uh, that means that you are um, adding another, you're putting Yash on the outside, Yash Neiman and the, and he is an experienced tackle. He has been in this league like for a long time. He has, accumulated a ton of snaps but now the depth on this offensive line is super slim what happens if another guy goes down on this offensive line I guess you got Chandler Zavala right behind any of those guard spots but like depth depth was a strength of this offensive line and guess what the offensive line was a strength of this offense and now that now that a lot of that's gone it it is concerning I mean Mike you've you've talked about it a lot Austin was among the most athletic 
to say he's one, among the most off, athletic offensive linemen in the league might be a stretch, but that was one of his strengths, right? And so you're losing a lot of that like explosive running ability when you lose Austin Corbett. Well, I I would say Brady Christensen is is an extremely explosive athlete. He's played basically every position on the offensive line. Is it a downgrade? Sure, but th- I think Christensen is going to be put in a spot to thrive. He is an impending free agent as well. But I want to talk about like the residuals of this this injury and why this impacts long term. Because really, all you can do is think long term when a team is one and four. It, there doesn't seem to be a positive end in sight. Corbett is an impending free agent. They reworked his contract a couple of times during his tenure here. They're going to have dead money on the cap, whether Corbett's here or not next year, um, because his contract voids. Coming off three major injury, well, I guess two major injuries and one in between, you know, you might say to yourself, you don't want to pay an injured guy. And the Panthers have typically not paid injured guys under David Tepper's leadership. He's also entering his 30s. So what that means is you have him potentially creating another hole at center. Andrew Rame has impressed, but he's also an undrafted rookie. You never know. They're volatile. Offensive linemen in general are volatile. Mm. Brady Christensen's about to become a free agent. If he does well, maybe he wants to cash in. Maybe he wants to play another position. Maybe he sees that he could have multiple options given what he has shown at left guard, left tackle, and center during his career. On top of that, there is a positive to this, and I I don't know if it'll be talked about. Damian Lewis has played center in the past. One of the things that I was very critical of entering this offseason is that they signed two guards as opposed to a guard and a center, because then there was no, basically a parachute for Iki Iguanu if he didn't work out at left tackle. Well, now you've invested in Damian Lewis and Robert Hunt. Damian Lewis is built like a center. Um, and I do wonder if that's something they consider down the road, especially if Iquanu doesn't kind of live up to their expectations at left tackle. Maybe you move him to left guard and then you invest in a left tackle next year. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that's kind of an interesting dynamic. I also think Taylor Moten's another guy they have refused to extend to this point. He might be a guy who is also he's got one more year left on his contract, but he's another guy who's got a pretty heavy cap number and they're going to pay for a bunch of reworkings of his contracts of his contract. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. That said. I do think they're in a position to where. If you're looking at this offensive line, it is a strength of the team. I agree. The depth is obviously concerning now that. You know, you're moving up your backup left, your backup center, and your backup right tackle. I think Nishman is going to play very well. And I think that Brady Christensen is built to be an athletic center in space, especially in, in this um, mid zone heavy defense. Yep. Uh, or uh, offense. Blocking yep. scheme. Sorry. Sorry. My, my kid yelled in the background. My brain got scrambled. I do think they'll drop off a little bit from run production standpoint. As I've said before, uh, Chuba Hubbard doesn't lose yardage. Christensen's a little bit more of a finesse blocker than um, Austin Corbett, but I think he'll he'll fit in relatively well these next 12 games. You bring up the depth. So typically teams have eight active offensive tackles. To this point, it had been the regular starters, Christensen, Ishman and Zavala. Mm-hmm. Zavala is now the the last man standing of the typical and inact- or active guys. My guess is Andrew Rame will take on Christensen's role, and then a tackle. It's kind of wide open. Um, Jarrett Kingston, the guard that they picked up from San Francisco, has played tackle, so maybe mm-hmm. they feel good about him being that third guy. I don't know. They might need to look into some practice squad guys. Ricky Lee is no longer here. Um, So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Uh, We're obviously recording this in the middle of Tuesday. So there's a chance that they could make a move on the practice squad later today. But Mike, uh, real quick, when did, so Andrew Raymond is in concussion protocol. When did he, when did he suffer that concussion? Do we know? During practice last week, according to Canales on Friday. Okay. 
And so we did ask Canales about the uh, possibility and the conversations being had of who's going to replace Austin at center. And Brady is, is Brady's the number one, obviously, and he's probably the most suited to impact to go in there and make an impact immediately. But you did ask a question about, hey, if Rain was healthy, would he be a part of the conversation? And Dave said, yeah, that is something that we're discussing. So, I mean, they have they are impressed with this Rain guy. Um, yeah, he, he 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 looked good in camp. I, I'll say that. I thought he looked relatively. It was not completely shocking that he made the roster. Got it. Cool. Um, but speaking of the roster, let's talk about Chicago because let's do it. They lost 36 to 10. Um, I think a lot of concerns were heightened in this game, particularly on defense. Um, I I just like, I I don't, I don't know how you solve a problem like the Panthers run defense. (laughs) Um, I also don't know how you solve a problem like Maria, but that's, that's another podcast. That's one that Zach's probably hosting. Um, How do you, wait, wait, you should make that into a song. How do you solve a problem like this defense? Oh, wow. That was I, good. I wanted like a kazoo in the background. You know, and it, you know like, <laughs> anyway, um, so let's get into it. Uh, this game was a mess. Uh, oh, offensively, gosh. defensively. I mean, the Panthers can't tackle to save Dude. their lives. Dude, I so I took some notes up in the press box. Well, we obviously I took. Well, notes I hope so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, obviously. But like reading them back, they're kind of comical. So obviously they start really detailed when the game is closed, and at the end they sure. get like they get kind of super vague and also kind of depressing. So th- so I'm gonna start like kind of halfway down the middle. I think this would be funny. So one note says Caleb Williams a bit more athletic slash elusive than I remember. Second and four shakes Nick Foles free, or sorry, shakes Nick Scott free, not Nick yeah, Foles. Nick Foles Foles, yeah, Nick Foles is retired. Is there any <laughs> place on offense? <laughs> <laughs> shakes Nick Scott free um, and finds first down on, and then that leads to a second touchdown drive. Next one. Now I'm combining run. Now I'm combining defense and offense. Run defense bad. Andy Dalton, six of seven for eight yards. Looking pretty bleak right now. Next, next one. Jadavian Clowney injury. No more people on defense. Low key. And then my final one says Andy Dalton. Dot dot dot. Yeah, that was. I mean, that's something about. Right. I should have turned yeah. that into Lydia. I think she would yeah, have published yeah, that. Yeah. Our editor would appreciate that one. It's definitely shorter <laughs> than my two thousand words of grades. Um. So here, let's get into the numbers. So the Panthers allowed. 128 yards on the ground and three touchdowns. Now it took 39 attempts to do that. They only averaged 3.3 yards per carry. But when you look at their red zone numbers and the red zone efficiency, I believe they were three of four on third down and three of four in the red zone. Like that's a failure on your part. I mean, a 75% chance of scoring and converting on third downs is a yikeroni and cheese. If you know what I'm saying, I do. And then receiving wise, yuck. So Caleb Williams completed 20 of 29 passes. That's 69%. Nice. Um, All right. 304 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, Both touchdowns went to DJ Moore. I thought the Bears schemed up the Panthers very, very well. The one touchdown to DJ Moore. They were playing man coverage. We talked to JC Horn about this. He tried to pass off a route to Shaw Smith Wade. They both got caught in a rub route and it just like they broke free. It was a man beater and Mm -hmm. you know, DJ Moore got his revenge. I mean, this was, this was like, they put on a show against this defense, but I think offensively uh, their pass defense was terrific. And that's notable because the run defense, the run defense got off to such a horrible start. And so I think when you look at, what they were able to do on the ground, it didn't really compromise the bears pass defense. And that was the real story of the game is that cool. You did well on the ground early on, but once they started to build the lead, the pass defense just kind of, you know, got its footing and really didn't allow a ton of explosives when the game Mm -hmm. actually mattered. I mean, Um, one thing that was, one storyline that emerged after the game was why did Dave Canales as the play caller abandon the run so quickly? And 
watching the game and I don't think, and I think the stats back this up, you can maybe look at it. I never got the vibe that he abandoned the run game. I thought it was a question. He Well, obviously at a certain point when the game got out of hand, he did. And because he had to, you got to, he thought he had to throw his way back in the game. But like, I thought it was largely a product of the Panthers not converting on third down and sustaining drives. Like the, the, that was what he said. Yes. Well, I, well, I, I guess I agreed with him. Maybe. So, even, so I'll give you, I'll give you a very clear. Um, I don't know, but just to, their third down play. Okay. So basically it was like a third and four, third and five. And the, the bears defense was like begging them to run, begging them to run. There was one, basically it was the defensive line and one linebacker. And at that point, Chuba Hubbard was averaging 10 yards a carry. Um, I believe Chuba only had six carries in the first half. Mm. And that was after the 38. I mean, and that was including the 38-yard run for a touchdown. He got away from the run. Like, sometimes you just got to be stubborn with it. And, look, I get it. They were behind phase and a lot of opportunities. That's to what Canals and your point was. But at some point when you're picking up chunks of yardage the way that they were, I just like kind of don't understand why you would get away from it. Uh, you know, I, I think Canales has done a really good job pre-snap uh, through the first three weeks. Didn't think the play calling was as clever as it had been the past two weeks. I don't know if that was a signal from the Bears defense just taking things away or what have you, but I kind of wasn't as impressed. I actually thought this was his worst play calling performance of, of the five game sample size. Mm. And that's going to happen. He's a rookie head coach. He's handling a bunch of different things. Nothing was going right. That's going to happen. But I think. Also, when you this have, is the, yeah. This is the best defense that he's faced like by a long shot. Oh, no question. But yeah. here's the thing. I'm going to go back to why it was abandoning the run in your notes. You put what he was six of seven for eight yards passing. Yeah, at one point. Yeah. Guess what? During that same phase, Chuba Hubbard was averaging 10 yards a carry. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Like, when nothing's working in the passing game, just run. Cool. You might not pick up every third down, whatever. But, like, it just kind of felt like you were setting yourself up to fail by going to the pass. I get it. You have to pick up chunks of yardage. They were not. That's just the reality of the situation. Until that 31-yard completion to Jalen Coker that led to the missed field goal, they were not picking up yardage through the air. So at some point you have to treat the run game as your go-to and maybe it's you working more screens. So it's kind of a hybrid of a run pass, but like nothing was working passing wise. I think my biggest concern from this is the run defense is not getting better. Uh, Josie Jewell's injured. Jadavian Clowney's dealing with a shoulder injury. Shaq Thompson's out for the year. Derek Brown's out for the year. Jordan Fuller's on IR. Dan Jackson hasn't come back. Yeah, I mean, this run defense, tackling, positioning, there were there were key sequences where they had too many men on the field. Like, this this just seemed like an all-encompassing disaster, very similar to the Saints game. Mm. And I, I just – I don't know what the solution is. Now, Dave Canales is a first-year head coach. He is learning on the job. He has taken on it, an exponential amount of responsibility by being – the QB coach, the the offensive coordinator, the head coach, um, doing all these charity events. Every, like, there's a lot on his plate. Mm-hmm. And I do wonder at some point if it makes a little bit more sense down the road to give up some of that stuff. Um, that's something that's always in a head coach's back pocket, especially when he's a play caller. I don't think now's the time because he's still kind of figuring it out. But I do wonder as we get into November, like, at some point you need to figure out who you are and what this team is. Cause I don't really know what the identity is outside of giving the ball to Chuba Hubbard and, and, and running behind that offensive line. Oh wait, now your starting center's gone. So like there's a lot going on there. Um, speaking of responsibility, speaking about all that stuff, I think we do need to kind of talk about the elephant or the quote in the room. Okay. Uh, following the game after allowing Bryce Young to go in the fourth quarter with everything out of commission, uh, Dave Canales was asked about why he wanted to put Bryce out there. When he spoke, he initially alluded to concerns about the offensive line having a switch up, uh, wanting to protect Andy Dalton, who's 36. 
and getting Bryce Young some time. Now, well, I have the quote right here if you want me to. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, so this was on – we asked – uh, why Bryce Young played at the end, why, the reasoning behind him getting in the game. Canal said, quote, just saw it as an opportunity there. We had a couple of injuries on the offensive line. Again, wanted to get him in there to get some live reps. He did a fantastic job playing with energy, extending plays, finding some completions downfield. That was fantastic. It is a hard situation, but at that point, with the different things happening on the offensive line, it was something where I wanted to get quarterback – or something where I wanted to get Andy out of there. Just give Bryce an opportunity to play some good football while we still had time, end quote. Okay, and then Monday, that kind of caught steam because it made it sound like Young's health did not matter to him. Right, yeah. Uh, Listen, there are always times where there's garbage time and a backup quarterback comes in, but this is a team that has said, no, we still think that he has franchise quarterback potential. So it's a confusing, contradicting thing Mm -hmm. to say. Also Mm -hmm. to protect the 36-year-old instead of – the guy who's your biggest asset for as far as investment kind of is weird. A lot of people took the cheese on that one. To me, what was more compelling was that he was talking about the offensive line, like two backups that they just picked up off the street were playing center and right tackle. Now, Mm. full context, Brady Christensen has started a lot of games in his career. I know he's not a natural center, but he's been learning this since the summer. He had about as much prep for this as Austin Corbett. He's also played several positions. He's a veteran. He's also well paid in the last year of his rookie contract. Then they uh-huh. brought in swing tackle Josh Not Josh Nijman, who is being paid two years. I mean, getting a two year eight million dollar contract. By the way, he's one of the highest paid backup offensive linemen in the league. So mm-hmm. you're having these two veterans come in. It's not like you're having like an undrafted guy from you know Mount Union and like a you know, a guy who's a journeyman who has played like three games. You know what I mean? Like this is not. Also back up, where did Mountain Union, where do you come up with this stuff, dude? I don't know. I get that question a lot, but on a lot of different subjects, as you know. Um, (laughs) So no offense to Mountain Union at all, but they're not necessarily a treasure trove of NFL talent. Uh, Actually in front offices and head coaching, it's actually a coaching hotbed. Okay. Um, It's a good point. Yeah. um, But. What I would say is like that kind of that kind of struck me as like, are you doubting your backup offensive linemen who have a ton of experience? Yeah. So what happened was on Monday, you were in Chicago, I was home celebrating my kid's first birthday. Woo. I asked I asked Dave to clarify his thoughts about Young and the offensive line and all that stuff. And he said the logic was this the game is out of hand. This is an opportunity to get Bryce in there and let him play football. And we have, and we had some time on the clock. And the cool part was we manufactured a pretty good drive out of it. And we were able to get some valuable reps. And that's really always my approach and thought process as we go into things. What does this game look like? Going into the end of it, are we within reach of working ourselves back in? If not, are there people that can, people we can get valuable reps? Jalen Coker having some nice plays in that situation. And obviously, Bryce being able to go out there with his guys to go out there and play ball. Yep. Okay. Let's let's talk about this. Let's do it. Uh, my take on this is I think he fudged up by saying the, the quiet part out loud. That yep. is fine. I think a lot of people wrote, you know, he could have just lied about this. And I think something that... Dave has done intentionally or unintentionally is contradicted himself a lot uh, in press mm-hmm. conferences. I think we should not chastise somebody for being honest because that's what everybody wants is honesty. Um, to me, the situation's difficult because you're inheriting somebody who this team has invested a whole lot in and you've mm-hmm. got to be very careful about what you say. I also think with Bryce Young, there is a natural tendency to look at him like a young guy because he looks like a young guy and, you know, you're also managing his feelings. But to me, you're kind of throwing the offensive line under the bus there. I I just like, I mean, it's like if I had to be sick and then you had to cover something like I, I have no problem. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just, it doesn't. 
it wasn't like they they had two rookies put out there and this was a mess. I mean, you still have your two highly paid guards and your first round left tackle. I just like to me that was kind of that was a bigger uh huh than anything. Like I understood his his idea of hey, you know, Andy Dalton's 36, we got to protect him if he's the quarterback, you know, it's all about messaging. I just think from Canales' standpoint, he's learning a lot in his first year on the job. Mm -hmm. Does he deserve some grace? Probably. I do think there are times where he could learn to, you know, take a breath and kind of think before his answers. Um, But, I mean, I know that you say that, but also going back to what you said earlier, I appreciate honesty, even if it does – I mean, even if it does require him clarifying something the next day, which is something that we'll always do. Mike, you were the one to ask We didn't jump on him, right? We didn't – I mean, while other outlets were talking about how great of a performance Bryce had, which was not accurate. No. um, Yeah, we can talk about that too. Yeah, that was was something. Creating those headlines is wild to me. He had one really great pass that he – he actually made more difficult than he needed to. So thank you. He got flushed from, I, I have watched that replay so much because it keeps popping on my timeline and it's like, wait, why did he run from the pocket? He wasn't flushed from the pocket. Like, yeah. like the pocket was pretty stable. Yeah. He I didn't trust it. his pocket at all. It felt like throughout that entire segue. And yeah. I was writing during it, but I rewatched it and I was just like, eh. You know, you take the good, you take the bad, and then you have the facts of life. And the facts of life with this quarterback situation is it's open ended, right? Like I've said to you before, I didn't think Andy Dalton would like light the world on fire and take this 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 quarterback situation by the like the horns. That said, if you look at the splits, Andy Dalton's production, even when he's bad, is exponentially better than what Bryce Young was doing the first two games. So I understand um, the need to do like to stick with Andy Dalton. And I think that's the right answer, but also I don't think we're very far away from, Hey, let's see what Bryce has got. Because when you look at everything and and let's get into this because we are kind of. We're long winded today. Yeah. We're we're long winded and we're sticking to the past. Let's stick to the future. A schedule that looked very, very uh, promising has now gotten a lot scarier. The Falcons Mm -hmm. are on a huge swing right now. Kirk Cousins looks back to normal. They're going to play the Falcons at home uh, this Sunday. Then they go to Washington, where Jaden Daniels has looked phenomenal, like rookie of the year runaway. And then you have, what is it, New Orleans? Or no, no, then it's Denver. Denver started to pick it up. Bo Nix is not that good, but they've started to play really well for Sean Payton. Then you've got uh, New Orleans. Orleans. They're kind of a tough out, as we saw. I mean, they they ran the Panthers out of the building in week one. A lot has changed, obviously. People have figured out Kubiak's offense, you know, whatever. And then from there, I believe it's the Giants in Germany. And then the bye. Yep. Yeah, and so the Giants in Germany seems like a winnable game, but who knows? They've won two in a row now. Then after that, you're dealing with like Philly, Dallas, like all of these like Kansas you know, City. Oh yeah, yeah, all these playoff contenders and potential championship contenders. You know, when they won against the Raiders, you're like, well, maybe they can they can match last year's win total by the bye or even exceed it. And now it's like, where does the next win come? And you know, if you're ownership and you're the front office and you're the head coach and you're the coaching staff, you, you're kind of uneasy heading into this week. Their whole thing is being better one week better each week. Well, last week was a massive setback. So you're not only going to have to take one step forward, you probably want to take two or three if you want to make these games competitive again. And I think Look, the Falcons have their weaknesses. They're not necessarily the scariest team in the world while they're on offense, they're a top 10 pass, like total offense, and they're a top six passing offense. Their running game isn't terrific for a team that has B. John Robinson. Mm-hmm. And then on, you know, on defense, they're kind of middle of the pack. They rank 18th in total yards allowed. They're 29th in rushing yards allowed, which again, run Shuba into the ground. That's the one thing you really need to do. 
but they have a top 10 pass defense. So this team is going to have to run the ball. They can't get away from it. What's your outlook heading into this matchup against Atlanta? Um, so firstly, well done succinctly putting all that. The one uh, thing that I would amend is that Alex Zetlow is 5-0 and in his predictions this week, or uh, so far this That's season. That's why I tossed it to you. That's why I tossed it to you, because you're the Oracle. I mean, here's the thing, guys. If you are in a survivor league and like you are interested to and and you're interested to be like, okay, who am I? Who who do I know is going to win this week? Just listen to this podcast, or actually, no, read my newsletter because apparently I misled Mike in last week's podcast. But he did, he did. It. He did. It, it I said I said there was a poss- there was a strong possibility, but then I like did my magical reading up and I looked at my key stats and I was like, no, okay, uh, I think the Bears are going to win this one, but um. One pl- the place where my eye goes when I'm looking at this Atlanta team, well, there are two places. Firstly, is all of what Kirk Cousins has done, particularly last week against the Bucks. I mean, he absolutely lit him up. 500 yards passing. How did like? How is that even in a primetime game when that's his known crutch? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, he looked remarkable out there. It, it was like every time he dropped back to pass, he was throwing the ball 20. 20- 25 yards, which is something that's kind of rare in this day and age of the NFL. I mean, everyone's throwing it to the flat. Everyone's throwing it two yards forward. Like the only deep passes are coming off of your actions, your play actions, whatever. And he, and he's just dropping back and playing some old fashioned like football. He was looking like Aaron Rodgers, primetime Aaron Rodgers last week. Um, So that that's one place where my mind goes. The other place is the Atlanta offenses, third down conversion rate. They're at 30%, 30.77%, that which is 26 in the league. On offense. Yes. That's what I hopefully that's what I said. Um in on offense. That is not good. And the the Panthers need to get them to third down. They need to get them in third and five and third and threes and stuff like this. But if they can do that, th- that's a very that's a very good outlook for this team. Obviously, the Panthers are not the Bucks defense. Obviously, this Panthers defense is among, for a variety of reasons, the worst, or on close to the worst in the league. Oh, they're um, in the bottom third in basically every statistical major category. category. Yes, yeah. so that's different. And the other thing that I'm looking at is the their opponent's third down conversion is 48%, oh. the, the Atlanta Falcons defense. So I'm looking at those two things, and I'm seeing, wow, if the pan the Panthers have a real opportunity to win third down this week, and if they do that, that's one of the key outside of turnover margin, outside of explosive plays, third downs the, the third most important thing when it comes to indicating who wins and who loses games. Um, I think after a huge, hugely explosive game that this Falcons offense showed, I think that the Panthers can learn a thing or two about it. They can like the Falcons put a lot of really good stuff on tape that the Panthers can learn from. I don't know. I, I still reserve my right to change my decision, but I am like, it is so tempting to pick the Panthers this week. He, like, he is it, trying to beat me. He it is, is remarkably to tempting. I mean, dude, it is so tempting, bro. I, I, I am going to, I'll send you my newsletter before it goes out. So you get to like find it, but yeah, I'm just trying to get a win on the, I'm like the Panthers <laughs> when it comes to predictions right now. I'm one in four. I'm just trying to catch up to Scott. I, that's all I care about. Dude, I've, it I've is... accepted defeat here, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to have a rebuilding year. I'm trying to go nine and seven, you know, that's, I'm trying to. Trying to I totally, dude, I totally feel you. Just think of the third down conversion stuff. Think of can the Falcons put together two remarkably explosive passing attacks in back-to-back weeks. Well, I don't know, bro. Thing. It's really intriguing for really me. Really good offenses don't get to third down very often. Yes, yes. And that's it, part of it, and that's why third down percentage is misleading. And the Panthers seem to play in this wheelhouse of let's get to third and short. Well, I think they'd be better off if they just excluded third down by making big plays on first and second down. Yep. And now with that said, I'm not trying to be a hypocrite here, run the ball. Because Chuba <laughs> Hubbard is picking up five yards at a, a basically a clip, and he is balling. And so I think you've got to hunker down. You've got to tire out the, the defensive front. You've got to make this team buy into how well you're running the ball in that first half and then use it to open up the passing game in the second half. Yeah, it might be plodding and, and slow and whatever. 
you want to win at the end of the day. And that's really the way to go. You want to control the clock. You want to give them less opportunities and you want to run down their throat because that's what Chuba Hubbard does. Uh, the choo-choo train is coming um, down the it track. Don't stop. It don't stop. It don't stop. And he doesn't lose yardage. I saw a stat from somebody that he was got like a 67% success rate. You know how crazy that is as a running back, especially mm-hmm. with this offensive line. And here's the thing. They're going to come in doubting the Brady Christensen, Brady Christensen and Taylor Moten, uh, or Brady Christensen and Yash Nishman can't replicate what they're getting out of Corbett and, and Moten in the run game. If you want to get those guys settled in, run the ball early because mm-hmm. that will help them in pass protection as well. Alex, agree. I'm finished. Wrap this up. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks as always for listening to our pontifications on all things Panthers with Mike K and myself and our wonderful producer, Zach. Please. Oh, we didn't give Zach proper shout outs today. It's all right, though. Please subscribe and follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts by searching Processing Blue. And if you watch us on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever new episodes drop. And finally, please be sure to stick to charlotteobserver.com for all your Panthers needs. Stay humble, stay creative, and keep processing. That's a wrap, Zach.